Welcome to ProPractice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's tutorial is based on Träumerei, the seventh piece in Robert Schumann's Kinderszenen, Opus 15. This set of pieces is wonderful, and I just wanted to start today's video by reading something that Clara had written to Robert about these pieces. They were engaged at the time, so these were written in 1838, and in 1839, she wrote this to him. It's true, isn't it, that they belong only to the two of us. I simply cannot put them out of my mind. They're so simple, so heartwarming, so very you. I thought that was a very sweet sentiment and really sets up uh, this seventh piece, the Tremolai, um, very well uh, as it is dreaming, um, translated into English. So... No matter what you do with this, I do think there has to be an element of dreaminess, of love, of innocence, simplicity. We're very lucky to have all of these wonderful works that are accessible to late beginners or intermediate players from Schumann. We don't have that with every major composer like we do from Schumann. So uh, I'm very grateful to be here today presenting this to each of you. If um, you'd like to see other recordings, there are many wonderful ones online. One of my favorites is to watch Horowitz play this in his old age. Um, it's very sweet and very heartwarming. So I hope you enjoy this tutorial, and I will start with a performance of the piece. You probably will notice some inner lines that I'm bringing out. We will talk about those at length in the rest of the tutorial. I hope the pedal cam provides some Insight, I do want to say that this piano is very bright, so I will be using a fairly heavy amount of una corda pedal. If you're on a much more colorful piano or if your space isn't too lively, feel free to um, calm down the use of your una corda pedal. Una corda should be used according to the space you are in and the piano you're on. So here goes the uh, short performance of Toy Morai.
do that when you play. Release that last chord. Release it in your... First of all, you release your hands first, then you release the pedal, but it kind of looks like everything's happening at the same time. Then sit there for a second. Don't lose interest. Don't go like that. Um, keep the focus on that sound you're listening and then silence. It's part of the dream. And then you kind of come to your senses, wake up. So I love that piece. And I actually find a lot of pleasure in playing that several times in a row. You're going to discover a lot of nuances. Um, all of my inner lines that I wanted to bring out didn't come out perfectly in that one, I will say. Um, we will be going over a lot of different options that you can use. You will hear, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but the Horowitz recording, it's so sweet um, to listen to him play it. And he is very deliberate with some of his inner lines. I do some of the same things he does, and I also have a few of my own ideas about this. But whatever you do, be convinced of what you want to say with this piece. And you, you might be coming to this tutorial because you don't know what you want to say. So hopefully some of these ideas in this video can help you as you come up with your own interpretation. I think imitation is the quickest way to learn and then time is a way to make it your own. So don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. One of the worst pieces of advice I ever got from a judge at one of the competitions I did when I was younger, she said, don't listen to recordings because you won't develop your own voice. And what a tragedy that comment is because how would we know exactly what we wanted unless we were inspired in the first place by hearing someone else play this beautiful piece of music, taking the ideas that we love, and then making it our own. I think that is a much more wise and holistic way of going about forming your own interpretive ideas about a piece. Okay, so let's dive in to this uh, little first section here, this little A section, which repeats, okay? What I like to think of for interpretation, I wanna dive into that and then we can get into some more mechanics in a moment. But I like to think of this starting out quite softly and then crescendoing up to there. Now, if you just do a crescendo without any rubato, any pulling back, rubato referring to the pushing and pulling of time, if you do that, it will sound brash. If you go beautifully here and then and you're right on time, it'll sound forced and it will sound punched and perhaps a little abrasive. So if you do a crescendo, you need to massage it with a little bit of time. Notice I do kind of a strange thing with that. What a lot of students do is, and they feel like I'm gonna take time, and then they're like, oh shoot, I have three notes to play in the left hand. And then they rush that, and that rushing tends to make it once again sound a little abrasive or punched or rushed. So what I like to do is dum -bee -bum, ba -bum. I like to quickly come in with that left hand, those two little grace notes there. And then I take time to get to that D and place it. Da -bum. So it's da ta that's very cushioned and massaged right there. So I'm gonna be big here. Okay, if I make that decision to crescendo there, I've got a long way to die away. So don't start too soft right there. So watch out for your tie right here into the next measure. Stay big. And then less. Okay. What you'll hear in a lot of recordings, including the Horowitz recording, I think he does this every time. He goes. He brings in that left hand support, which is a gorgeous sentiment. I love that. But this first time, what I like to do is I like to keep things simple. Just as if we were playing a Scarlatti sonata, we don't want to ornament like crazy the first time we play uh, the A section because Scarlatti's sonatas are binary, so A and B and they're each repeated. So the first time through an A section, we don't want to 
rip ornament like crazy. We want to play the A section fairly straightforwardly uh, so far as notation, and then we can ornament the second time to make it more interesting. So I'm already this first time planning out how I'm going to contrast it with the repeat. So and then maybe a little less and then even less. Okay, and I probably will keep it simple just voicing that top rather than bringing in a bunch of inner lines. I'm going to save inner lines for the second time through on the repeat. Okay, continuing on diminuendo. Horowitz also really brings that line out. I Again, first time through, I don't like to make too much of it. Again, pretty soft. Ugh, that was terrible. Whatever you do, don't do this. And hit that, so. And then, again, I like another crescendo here. And again, you can pad it with time. Getting to there. Again, not too many inner lines going on yet. So that's a big diminuendo. So again, crescendo to there, diminuendo to there. Okay, I know that's hideous playing going that fast, but just to show you the shape of the line. Okay. Okay, now this time, what I will do is I will lead into this. So I'm a little more bold this time. Not so soft, because then what I can do is do the opposite phrasing. And maybe don't accent the E as much as I just did. So I'm a little more there. Then I can do a diminuendo. You can also vary the rubato. So you can go a little straighter. The first time I did a lot of rubato and pushed, and then I took a lot of time at the end. What I'll do this time is maybe a little straighter, like that. I think that sweetens it a little bit. So again, a little more here on the repeat, and then a diminuendo. You can really take time and set that. If you cannot reach that tenth, which I have giant hands and I can barely reach that. So you're gonna do a little pedal trick for me. So hold this and then change with the B flat. You can reference that pedal cam if you need help. I'm gonna hold that and then I'm gonna change quickly up down with my bass so I catch that in the pedal. And then you don't need to, students, whenever I teach them this trick, it's hilarious. They'll go perfectly and then they'll again change the pedal there. I'm like, the whole purpose was just changing on the low note. So change and then keep it down all right this time since we diminuendo there by the way if you do have big enough hands i didn't clarify you can wait to here to change your pedal if you can hold those again look i'm on the very edge of that b flat there um but it works and it's going slow enough that it's not a risk that i'm going to slip off so if you're soft here what we can do is we can Diminue. Start soft, excuse me, and then maybe a little more, and then even more, and maybe this is the time we bring in the left hand, De -da -dum. and then really speak with that left hand, be a little bigger there, and then this one is so sweet, diminuendo two. So I'm going to do a diminuendo and a lot of rubato, which contrasts nicely with what I just did on this first one, which was a little straighter. Yes, it was a diminuendo, but it was a little straighter rhythm. This next one, I'm going to take time. Really set that in because this to there. Wow, what an amazing harmony change. Inner line A flat to G. And that's about where most people leave it, and then they go back to the top line. But I know my teacher, Susan, I haven't ever played this for her, but I know she'd be like, 
where's that line going, Josh? And I'd be like, oh, it was just one little speck. And then I went back to the other. It's like, okay, yeah, that doesn't make sense. So um, I like to continue this line. Because Schumann writes that. It's beautiful. And remembering Logan, Skelton, um, he would often... So I, I've always been scolded by every one of my three teachers, uh, Sergei Babayan as well. I was playing Balad number three for him. And he said, what do you think? I'm some sort of idiot that you have to point that out so deliberately. Top line, middle, bottom. I just died laughing. That was so funny in that lesson. Uh, and that brings me back to something that Logan said. As we are voicing inner lines, if you do it at the complete exclusion of the traditional top line, so if you're going to bring out a middle line that's not traditional and you completely exclude the top, well, that becomes your principal line. That middle line is now the principal line. You can do that um, in many places, but you got to be careful not sorry, that can be a trap that you fall into in many places. You don't want to. So as we do this line, we don't want to go. It's too obvious. So you can kind of announce it pretty deliberately there. And then this one's a little more subtle. I think I was fairly subtle with that um, on the first time through, almost to the point that I was like, I should have voiced that a little bit more. So it's a fine line. And so far as the shape, we're quite soft there. Maybe we are a little softer there and then bring it in and then maybe stay big and get softer to there and then lead into there because this B section where we kind of depart from our traditional harmonies and it intensifies a bit before coming back in bar 17 to what we're familiar with. Obviously, this is a very short little middle section uh, in from bar 9 to 16, but it is a contrasting section. This is where the stirring of harmonies um, occurs, like really stirring up the harmonies. And then we're back to F major to B flat. We have a surprise harmony at the end. But I just wanted to point that out. We will, I, I'm personally convinced that going into bar nine, we should do a crescendo. So lead with this left hand to there because that can be a little bigger. so that this can be even sweeter and maybe a little more dreamy and atmospheric. Sorry. That'll create a lot of contrast in that small middle section. So that takes us through some ideas with how to create variety with our interpretation, with inner lines, with crescendos, diminuendos, and also with rubato. So I wanted to first present that before I even presented any mechanics, besides the little pedaling thing I showed you guys, because I want that to be the first priority. You might think, well, if you can't play it, who cares if you can't if you can interpret it? And that is true. You do need the technical facility to play this. It, not that it's a super technically demanding piece. You do need the mechanics, but I want you to think artistically because that artistic mindedness will help tremendously with the the mechanics. It's it's a very strange phenomenon, but I see it every single day. If I'm focusing on artistry, the technique falls into place. If I'm focusing solely on the technique and mechanics, 
the artistry greatly suffers and it's actually harder to put in later. It's almost like you're relearning the piece. So with that, now let's dive into some of the more basics like fingering, pedaling, ties, things like that.